All right, everybody, today we're gonna to have an important discussion about the Meet Kevin ETF. And if somebody could tag Kevin in this, or if Kevin, if you're watching this, my goal here is to do a fair review. And honestly, I'm just gonna tell you right now, I just have some very, very strong concerns. And so I would love a response or an answer from Kevin about some of these questions I have that are stopping me from ever investing in this ETF, even though Kevin has done a great job building a business and building a following on YouTube and all of that stuff. So let's get into it. All right, reason number one that I'm just concerned about uh, any ETF really, especially one without a track record of success or a parent company that has a track record that we can look at. Most active fund managers fail and fall behind the indexes. So this was came out this year. The latest report marks 12 consecutive years the average actively managed large cap fund underperformed the S&P 500. It's hard to outperform. It costs more for active managers when they're trying to compete with the S&P 500 that is essentially free through the ETF wrapper. And we'll get into expense ratios in a minute. And that's one of the concerns I have with Kevin's ETF. Problem number one, Kevin is not focused. If I have somebody managing you know, money that I'm putting into an investment or managing an entire fund, to me, that's like a full-time job or they need to have a team and support and resources. Kevin is doing a million things, which is great for him, but not great for a fund manager. And so just to give you an idea here, I mean, he's created about a million videos in the last two weeks on YouTube. He talked about right here how he just made a $13 million investment in this jet or whatever, which is so he can run his three different businesses, right? It, uh, it's this ETF, his content business on YouTube, and then this house hack thing where he's going to be traveling all over looking at investment properties. My question is just like, how can somebody be focused on investing and spend enough time, uh, especially for how this fund is laid out, to actually do a good job over the long term when they're so focused on different things? And his behavior is just irrational, right? I mean, we see him, he's out there tweeting things like this where he's talking about personal holdings. He's also talking about where he would buy straight shares or any tax advantage actively managed ETF. He's skirting around these potential SEC violations talking about what he is or isn't buying and, and doing in this ETF. And to me, it's just, I don't want a fund manager that I have money in doing anything like that. I think it's more likely that Kevin gets in trouble with the SEC and has some type of violation and can't continue running the fund or something like that. I think that's more likely to happen than not. He also had a tweet that I think he deleted that was talking about how he was intentionally spreading uh, FUD about Tesla so that he could buy more shares. That was after the fund came out and he has since deleted the tweet or at least I can't find it. So, uh, you know, there's that out there as well and that might come back to bite him. And this is probably a bigger problem. There's just no clearly defined process. And this leaves a lot up for interpretation and trying to time the market. It's just, it's, it's just not gonna work, at least not over the long term. So this is Kevin's portfolio overview in the strategy. The approach is to own innovative companies with pricing power. 70 to 100% of the portfolio. And then zero to 30% is targeted ETF selection and macro hedging. Okay, so these are the types of companies they look for. The sub-advisor begins its analysis by screening an extremely large initial universe of US listed companies with minimum market capitalization of 100 million. So if a fund is gonna own a company that is uh, you know, 100 million potentially, that company has a potential to be manipulated just by volume. And it's actually really hard for a fund of any size to purchase those. And so that's a risk right there. Okay, and, and this is what they say they do. Utilizing a proprietary screening methodology, the sub-advisor analyzes the initial universe of companies to identify innovative companies that the sub-advisors perceives as having greater pricing power versus their peers. Sub-advisor using its own internal research analysis analyzes the company's self-reported data, press releases, and regulatory filings, as well as third-party data, such as news articles, social media. But this is a joke, right? This is a total joke. There's no process here. There's nothing proprietary about this that other people can't just immediately do with trading bots and scan these things anyways. The problem is, is there's no quantifiable process here. It's all just vague and qualitative. And this macro hedging thing is actually a way to significantly hurt the portfolio over the long term. During periods when the sub-advisor believes there is significant risk to the market as a whole or a particular section of the market, the fund's portfolio may hold up to 30% of its net assets value in exchange traded funds to provide macroeconomic hedge against the anticipated market risk. So that could be geopolitical events, Federal Reserve, monetary interest rate decisions, extreme weather events. That stuff happens all the time. So what is the threshold for when to hedge, when not to hedge? 
When are you gonna hold 30% in hedges versus 100% in stocks? This is timing the market right here. There's always a reason to hedge if you're doing it this way. And so you're either always gonna have 30% in cash, which is a drag on returns over time, or you're gonna hedge at the wrong time, which there are disadvantages to hedging. So every hedging strategy has a cost associated with it. Before you decide to use hedging, you should ask yourself if the potential benefits justify the expense. Remember, the goal of hedging isn't to make money. So hedging does not make you extra money. It's to protect from losses. The cost of the hedge, every hedge costs money in some way, whether it's the cost of an option or lost profits from being on the wrong side of a futures contract can't be avoided. The point is, is hedging is a very hard thing to do, even for the most seasoned portfolio managers. And actually, if you're a true long-term investor, hedging is actually a drag on the portfolio over time. And if there was a time to hedge, it was in 2021 going into 2022, not on the backside of everybody knows interest rates are rising. Everybody knows we're heading into a recession most likely. There's a war in Ukraine right now going on. Like the time to hedge, the once in about a decade time to hedge has already happened. Let's show the difference between Kevin's non-process and actually what a real ETF process looks like. This is SCHD and this is just a part of their process. All index eligible stocks must have sustained at least 10 consecutive years of dividend payments, have a minimum float adjusted market of capitalization of 500 million. See, notice Kevin goes down to 100 million. That's super risky, 500 million right here. Uh, and meet minimum liquidity criteria. The index components are then selected by evaluating the highest dividend yielding stocks based on four fundamental based characteristics, cash flow to total debt, return on equity, dividend yield, and five-year dividend growth rate. Again, they're listing specific things that they screen for and look for, not just vague statements like in Kevin's prospectus. Stocks in the index are weighted based on a modified market capitalization approach. No single stock can represent more than 4% of the index. This is really important. You'll see how concentrated Kevin's ETF is and how dangerous that is. The third reason is extremely high fees. So SCHD, VU, SCHD, VUG, and then even ARC, right? Every single one of them has a expense ratio that is 10 to even 15 times lower than Kevin's ETF, right? So you can see SCHD 0.06, VU 0.03, SCHG 0.04, VUG 0.04, and Kevin's ETF is 0.77. The only thing close is ARC, right? The other thing I want you to see is just how small and risky this ETF is, right? $1 million in assets under management uh, versus $144 billion with VUG, $14 billion with SCHD, $789 billion with VU, 45 billion with SCHD and the smallest is ARC at 7.5, right? So Kevin's PP is tiny compared to the rest of these funds, even Kathy Woods. All right, Prince, it seems like 0.7% difference in fee really is nothing, right? But here's two examples. So this top example would be Kevin's ETF, right? Uh, if you start with $1,000, invest for 10 years and get a 7% rate of return, which I do not think Kevin's will achieve, compound annually with $500 annual contributions, you would end up with $87,493 after putting $60,000 in, right? So a nice $27,000 gain over 10 years, right? Okay, if you start with the same amount, $1,000, 10 years, 7.73%, which this would be the difference between saying owning VUG versus Kevin's ETF and still putting 500 bucks in a month, you end with almost $91,000 instead of that $87,500 for a gain of almost 30,000 versus 26,500. So you're talking about a 10 to 11% more gain owning something with just a 0.73% lower expense ratio. Now imagine if you're adding more money or investing for 20 or 30 years, that's gonna compound. So it's a huge difference over time. All right, and finally, I just wanna show you the comparison again of Kevin's ETF versus these other ones. You can see some of these actually pay a nice dividend, which can be helpful during times of inflation and, and tough times. Um, generally dividends and growing dividends are paid by stable companies and all of this stuff, so the dividend can be nice, right? But the performance has actually been really great too. Over 10 years, this is not even including the dividend. This is just the price performance. So if you include the dividend, it's even better. SCHD is up 161%, VU is up 172%, SCHG is up 233%, and VUG is up 207%. But what I wanna focus on is how risky some of these concentrated, tech-focused, non-experienced ETFs can be, right? Kathy Wood and ARC, as great as they did in 2018, 19, 2020, is now negative for the last five years 
compared to even SCHD, not including its dividend, up 47%. So who do you wanna trust? Do you wanna trust the latest, hottest fund that's doing well, or do you want to trust seasoned funds? You can get some growth exposure, you can go dividends, you could just go the S&P 500. Where do you wanna put the, your hard-earned money? With somebody that you don't know, irrational behavior, not a team, no resources, just chasing the latest, greatest thing, or a seasoned professional, right? And this is the probably the riskiest part outside of just the total lack of an experience, but he's got 21 holdings and 78% in the top 10. That is extremely concentrated and extremely risky. There are people who you find quotes out there, Charlie Munger, Warren Buffett, talking about you know concentration being great in, in uh, for professional investors or whatever, but the majority of people are not as good as Charlie Munger or Stanley Druckenmiller or these other people that you see with these concentrated portfolios. They're just not that good. And so to have a brand new fund manager with no experience owning 21 holdings and 78% in the top 10 is extremely alarming. And you don't need to do that to make good money over time. SCHD, 41% in the top 10. VU, 25%. SCHG, 50%. And VUG, 46%. Hey, okay, and finally, let's get to the top 10 holdings, right? You see Tesla at 23%, Apple at 13, a US Treasury note at 7%, Taiwan Semi at 7, the Trade Desk at 5, and the Invesco uh, bearish on the dollar, right, at 5%. Here's the thing, that hedging, you can't hedge a 23% position in a single stock that's as volatile as Tesla with an index hedge unless it is a directly hedged index against Tesla, which can be super risky and just destroys value. So this whole hedging strategy will not even work with the type of portfolio that he uses. It's just gonna be a drain on on money over time. And so if you want exposure to these tech stocks, which I'm a fan of, right? Going with something like VUG, Vanguard Growth ETX, you get 13% of Apple, which was another top holding of his. And so basically that fund is gonna be decided by Tesla and Apple, plus the drain on cash from his hedging strategy, right? So if you want exposure to Apple, you get 13% here, 11% in Microsoft, 4.8 in Amazon. Then you get some Google, Tesla, Nvidia, Visa, Home Depot, MasterCard. Those are just the top 10, right? But then you don't get this ridiculous hedging strategy and you get you know, a bunch of other tech stocks, which I'm not saying this is the best way to go necessarily, but I would much rather own this than Kevin's ETF. If somebody shares this with Kevin, um, I'd love to hear his response. I'd love to see what he says, what his his defense, and maybe he's got a great response to it and I, I'd love to hear it. So I uh, would love to hear back from Kevin.